Uh, we have a new research opportunity for an undergrads, and it's going to be on if somebody's really super psyched about skis. We have a local company and the University of Utah, we have a new research partnership. So if this is you, send me an email and we'll chat. Um, it'll be at least five hours a week. You gotta have at least that much time to put on it and maybe 10 and it's paid, right? So it's not even just like a, a crummy research. It's actually gonna be decent. Um, on, it's it gonna be at least for probably the rest of the semester and it could go longer depending on our, our results. You'll be doing friction of a new waxless ski and you'll also be doing delamination testing as these, as these composites get pulled apart. Um, okay, another quick announcement on homework seven, it's posted. One or two of you already started, and we decided to change problem five. Problem five originally said to compare, I think, like this alloy's toughness and resilience with, I don't know, one of these. But it was hard because neither of these had a very good elastic region. So now I've changed it to 8650 steel, this one right here, and the annealed copper. And there's an announcement about that, and it's changed on here, and I've reposted the homework. So that's the one thing that's changed on the homework. And then the last thing to talk about before we start class is that today we're going to be talking a lot about deformation and we'll use it in the context of metals at first. And speaking of deforming metals, we had a super rad lab this week where the MSC 2010 students made super awesome objects. Like we started with, well actually we didn't do any of this, this was the blacksmith guy that helped us. But he started with a, a steel ball bearing like this, see it looks like, wherever it is, right there. And then from one of those he made these in about an hour and it was rad. The dude's legit. He had an anvil as the trailer hitch on his truck. I don't need to say any more than that. <laughs> Our 2010 students, with some help, were able to produce knives that looked kind of like these. So, I mean, they were, they're not terrible. <laughs> they would probably kill something if, you know, if you put them to it. <laughs> but they were pretty good. And then the last thing I'll show you was, we, uh, we had some tongs, but we had like wimpy scientist tongs that the blacksmith did not approve of. So we had this huge sheet of rebar, and I kid you not, in less than 10 minutes, he had made these tongs, which worked delightfully. Every bit of it, from the flattened bits, he drilled through it, he took a random bit of metal and made it a cylinder, put it through, punched the top and bottom, and now we have great new tongs. So if you're not taking 2010, I apologize that you missed out on all that radness, but we'll make up for it today, because today, here's what we're gonna learn about. We will talk about plastic deformation, which is just denting metal, right? That's plastic deformation. And we're gonna relate it to dislocation motion. We're gonna describe dislocation strain field interaction and relate that to cold work hardening, recovery and recrystallization. We'll talk about slip systems if we have time. Um, we'll even calculate a few. And we'll even calculate it for single crystals, but I bet we don't have more than time than that. So to start with then, our first clicker question, get your clicker ready. Would you rather learn about deformation mechanisms in the context of Thor's Mjolnir hammer or Jon Snow's long claw sword? And this says a lot about you, so I want you to choose wisely here. This is an important decision, right? Let me pause it. Okay. Choose, but choose wisely. There's no, obviously, no, no right answer here. You will get your point regardless, but there is a right answer. Okay, get your answers in. Choose, but choose wisely. Okay, am I good to good to do it? Hit the button. All right, twenty-seven seconds. So if you're just showing up, hurry and get your clickers out. Channel 41, session 442980. He's racing the clock in the back. I can pause it if you need. You good? Let me pause. All right, get your answer in. You good? Let me know when you're good. Good? Okay, we're, we're going. So what do people think? Thor's hammer or Jon Snow's sword? What will it be? I'm so, so excited. Uh, 
Impossible. Impossible. Yeah. Every year. Every year. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Let's do the hammer. Okay. This is an episode that you can find on YouTube called Man at Arms. Maybe. If you haven't watched these, welcome to your Friday night tonight. It's delightful. <laughs> Speaking of which, the anvil that our 2010 students used this week was exactly the same size as this, and it was 200 pounds, and I couldn't even lift it. Like, this thing was way too big for a scientist like me, right? <laughs> <laughs> way too big. <laughs> Okay, everything that he describes, he's a blacksmith and he's just done this out of experience and had people tell him what to do. We can describe it in terms of material science, why he's doing this. So he said he's going to take this hammer. If you look at it, it's not just like, it doesn't come to a point on the edge, right? Thor's hammer has like this little bend thing on the corners, right? So to make that happen, he said, we're going to have to bend it on the vise, but first they scored it and they heat it up. Why do you score it and heat it up? If, if it was brittle and you score it, it'll break there. We don't want to break it, actually, but by scoring it, it's just like when you fold a paper, you crease it first, and then it's easier to fold it right along that. Same reason. It's going to cause it to uh, deform in a nice straight line, scoring it first. Why do they heat it up? Metal becomes softer. It becomes more ductile. It's easier to work with, and there's less likelihood of it fracturing. By the end of this chapter, we'll know why it fractures if you do it cold and why it doesn't fracture when you do it warm. By the way, I think we should have this soundtrack during just like a regular lecture. <laughs> you can see the dislocation moving. <laughs> Gas. How does it work, Matt? Do you have any idea of it? That's what it stands for. Anybody well in, who's our well in here? You always got a few. Is it Nate? Yeah. Nate. Uh, it just creates an electric arc, which creates heat, and then it has a shielding gas to keep coolness and the atmosphere from getting into the ground. Bingo. And then Yep. Imagine you could control a little tiny arc of electricity like a lightning bolt. It's basically what you're doing. You're providing a large bolt of electricity basically across this thing. It locally melts the metal, just like a lightning bolt would if it were to hit something, right? So now when it's molten, if that's exposed to air, 
you've got iron or something, it's going to form an iron oxide. That's the thermodynamically stable phase. So to prevent that, it, there's, the, there's the arc, but it's shielded by this sort of envelope of gas, inert gas, something like argon, right? So TIG welding is that inert gas, blows on it, that blows the air out of the way so that the metal just bonds with the metal, you don't form oxide. Because if you get oxide in there, you get a crummy weld that breaks. What is silver soldering? So they basically you've got the pommel, right? And they've got this cool little Celtic design on it, made of some other metal. It's, I think it's just a pure brass, right? Um, they need to stick that on there and so we're going to silver solder it on there, I think is what he said. What is silver soldering? Sometimes called brazing. It's a type of brazing. What's brazing? It's not welding um, because welding, you take the two components you want to join. Like if I wanted to weld these two prison shank of knives together, right? I would melt them and then just touch them and like leave them there until it cools off a little bit and they're welded, right? Brazing is different. If I were to braze these two together, I set them on top of each other however I want them, right? And then you take a solder, just like an electrical solder, right? Similar concept. You don't use actually lead, and here they're gonna use silver. Something that melts at a lower temperature than these, put it near the edge, heat it up, and then surface energy, it wants to actually go in to reduce its surface energy. So it actually goes in and like suck into there. When that cools down, the solder is what melts and cools down and holds it together. So it's not the metals themselves that are molten. <laughs> Hence why they just blast it with the torch. As soon as they hit that torch, whatever the flux is, whatever, the, uh, not the flux, sorry, the solder is, or whatever is the brazing agent, melts, goes inside, and it sticks. And you avoid melting it and losing the nice intricate pattern, which is the whole point. We took a look at the screen capture showing the details of the first camera from the movie, and it had this detailed like or lighting interface on the basis of it. We drew a pattern on the belt and then made a stencil for like a chemical etching. The stencil is a polymer resin silk screen. He's a material scientist, look at him go! <laughs> Electrochemical etching, polymer, vellum, right? So what's vellum real quick? That's a baby animal. We're sorry about that. That's baby animal, right? So they take baby animal. This is actually the coolest part of the video. Not the fact that they use vellum, but the fact how they put this on there. So they took vellum. The, the reason they use vellum is because they need it to be um, Basically, you want something that you can etch a certain layer where you're going to have um, electrical activity across this green layer, but not elsewhere, right? And vellum turns out to work well for that, okay? They made that pattern. I can't remember how I said it. I think they said they silk screened it on or something. So they made the pattern, and then they're going to electrochemically etch this hammer. So how would you do that? You guys took, well, you guys were there for chapter 16. How would you etch this out? What would you do? Well, you could apply an acid to it. They don't do that. They actually drive it with a voltage. So what are they going to need to do? Anytime you have electrochemistry, you must have two things. They are anode cathode, meaning that you have oxidation and reduction. So do you want to oxidize or reduce the metal ham uh, hammerhead? Reducing is gaining electrons, so you don't want that. You want to oxidize it. You want it to lose electrons. So you want iron to go from iron to iron 2 plus and wash away, basically. So we're going to oxidize that, so we must reduce something else. So he's going to reduce something else. What will he use? Carbon electrode. That's what's getting reduced. You're reducing carbon. The, that sort of, the electrolyte you're spraying on there, what's the purpose of it again? Why do you have to have an electrolyte? It's the salt bridge, the salt bridge which did what? It accomplished ion transfer. Why do we have to have ion transfer? Turn to your neighbor real quick. Remind him why you need ion transfer. Yes. 
Okay, somebody remind me, what's the ion, what is it, what do you have to have ion transfer for? Anybody feel confident-ish? Somebody feel not confident at all? <laughs> Carl, let's hear it. <laughs> You need to be able to let them move so that you can have the electrons move from one to the other, right? Yeah, you've got your anode cathode. You have to have your loss electrons here at the anode, right? They're going to travel over here to the cathode, right? So as electrons travel that way, you're building up electronic field, electric field, right? And that would eventually stop the reaction because electrons, it would, it would resist further travel. So you have to make up for the electrons traveling here by some positive ion also going over there, so that it's electrically neutral, right? That's the salt bridge. Science. types of steel, now he's got aluminum. What do you think he did the aluminum there? I don't know if there's a right answer here. What do you think, Matt? It um, retains its strength for relatively um, little weight. So basically you still have the hammer and it looks beefy, but you're saving on the weight because it's already going to be super heavy. That's probably a really good guess. Did you have your hand up, Chris? Or Steve? I forgot your name. Yeah, you who's looking behind you. Chris? It's Chris. No, it's Steve. I'm Chris. Chris. I knew it. Right, so uh, I don't know the reason. I'll bet because it's easy to shape, it's easy to form, it's easy to cut, and working with steels already makes for long days, but I don't know. Nickel plated the whole thing, what did he do? That's chapter 16. That's more stuff that we know about. How do you think he did it? He put it in a bath. What's in the bath? Nickel ions. Right, or you could have nickel metal that turns into ions. You could, depending on how you do it, right? But he needs some source of nickel, probably a, in a uh, in a salt form, right? And then you need to turn those into nickel metal by oxidation or reduction. Reduction. Reduction is gain, right? It's nickel two plus or nickel three plus. You need to give it electrons to turn into nickel, right? So this is just electrochemistry all over again. So that's why this is actually a decent video. Is it does do a lot of electrochemistry. Yep. So if you want to see him smash watermelons and stuff with it, tune in later. I know, I know. Let's do it. Let's do it. single thing that he did we could explain in terms of material scientists and a lot of these guys so the dude who made these things like we couldn't make these we tried for a long time we were really bad at it he could do it because he's experienced and he knows what's going on but he doesn't understand the principle of what's happening and deformation all has to do with material science so 
Let's explain it in a little bit more detail with this chapter, right? So let's talk about how do you deform as well as strengthen uh, materials. What mechanisms are there, right? So start with deformation. We've already said that plastic deformation is permanent deformation. It's stuff that we're stuck with. It doesn't go away, right? It involves breaking and reforming bonds, right? And it usually includes the motion of dislocations. Um, we'll show this in just a second. So an edge dislocation can travel in the direction perpendicular to its line and parallel to the applied force. So this first one is our edge dislocation, right? So the line went up and down right there, right? This was our line of dislocation. But the dislocation motion is perpendicular to that and parallel with the applied forces, right? And if we push that all the way through, all the way till when it's gone, right? If we push that all the way through, it will actually, that extra half row of atoms will pop out at the end, just like it is here, right? So technically, by that deformation, that dislocation, excuse me, by that dislocation moving through the material, we achieve macroscopic deformation, okay? You can do the same thing with a screw dislocation, right? Here's our screw dislocation to start with. This time, the dislocation line goes that way, and the dislocation is going to move perpendicular to it, but perpendicular to the applied force, right? You get the exact same deformation in either case. As you unzip that sort of helix, you end up with the same thing, right? Same dis dislocation. So either of the motion of these can give you deformation. Dislocations, if you want a material to deform, you want to have dislocations present, and you want them to be able to move easily. But there's a catch. We'll get to it in just a second. Um, okay, so when, when these dislocations move, right? Here's our extra half row of atoms. Right, right there, right there, right there. You can see that it moving requires bonds to break and reform, right? This bond right there has to break, right? And then it's going to reform with that one, right? That's why we have this one here, and now this is broken, right? So it requires this constant breaking and reforming of bonds. So it does take energy, right? It's not like this happens without any energy cost. It does take energy for it to happen. That's why you have to apply a force for these things to happen. Hence why these guys, you saw him using like all the different hammers and stuff. They'd heat it up, but they still had to pound on it to move these things, to force these dislocations to move. So the dislocation density can be expressed as a total dislocation length per volume, meaning if you took a volume, right, the volume of the sphere, it's got dislocations in it. If you added up all the lengths of all the dislocations in this, it would be a length, right? Or if you were to cut this in half, right, then you have, um, in a cross-sectional area, you'd say that it's a millimeter, it's, it's basically a, it's a total length per volume. Therefore, on a cross-sectional area, you're going to end up with a density, right? So some number per the area squared, right? So what can these numbers be? Well, on the low side, you could have, you know, 10 to the three maybe per millimeter squared. So still tons, tons and tons there, if that's the low side. And on the high side, you could have a billion, right? 10 billion. So tons of these things can be present in a material. When you heat treat it, so if I, when we took this little knife that they were making and they were pounding on it, pounding on it, pounding on it, Every time they hit it with a hammer, that created thousands, maybe millions of, of dislocations, right? So to get rid of those, you had to then put it back in the fire. And why would you get rid of them? What do you think? What is the fire? Why does putting it in the fire get rid of dislocations? It gives them thermal energy, right? Imagine like you guys wanted to arrange yourself in this row in some different way, right? But I froze you solid. You can't do it. If I then add some energy and allow you to move around, then you can stand up and sit right there, right? dislocations can move and it's the exact same way they need thermal energy hence why the blacksmith keeps on putting it back in the fire to get it glowing orange or even hotter and then he takes out and deforms because it, there's more thermal energy for things to move around easier and when it cools down if you keep hitting it then those dislocations can't move and instead of getting deformation you might get fracture in fact you will get fracture we, we learn all about fracture right so ceramics have typically way lower numbers of dislocations than metals like orders of magnitude lower um, in fact, some things like high purity electronic single crystals of silicon that they use in electronics can have just bonkers low, like one per millimeter squared, very, very low. And you can actually see these. If you take a, a, a metal and you put a little bit of acid on it, the acid will etch the regions of highest energy first, which will be your dislocation cores, right? Because along your core, like see these like red and blue areas here? Your red and blue areas are areas that are under tension, the blue, or compression red. So those things already cost more energy. So where's the acid going to attack? It's going to attack right at those things, right? So if you etch a metal, you can see the dislocations. Little, they look like little pit marks, right? So you can, actually, you can actually visualize these and count them, and some people do that. Okay, th so these dislocation strain fields make a big difference in properties, right? 
So for example, I said that every time that you, you hit a material, you introduce dislocations. So if you're a blacksmith, I took this out, I'm pounding on it, and I'm causing it to flatten out slowly over time. But the more that I hit it, the more dislocations there are. Will the dislocations interact with one another? Yes, you betcha, right? Imagine this scenario. These two extra half cells, let me draw a different color so it's easier to see, right? There's an extra half row, extra half row right there. If we bring those together, so now you've got two extra half rows right by each other, the amount of strain is now multiplied, right? We got tons of compression, tons of tension. So we, it got worse, right? That made it worse. So in fact, because of that, dislocations don't come together if they're the same sign. They move away from one another. And we'll see a video of that in just a second, right? However, if they're opposite signs, imagine if I had an extra half row pointing down right here. Then it could come over, this could come over, it would meet in the middle, and you've got just one nice new perfect lattice. They both would annihilate, right? So opposite, uh, dislocations of the same sign repel one another. Opposite sign attract and can even annihilate, right? So when you heat something up, you put it back in the fire after you cold worked it like crazy, all you're doing is you're giving it the atom's energy to shift around and move around and make your positive ones match up with your negative ones and annihilate. And then you reduce your dislocation density. It's hot again. You can take it back out and pound on it again, which is why blacksmiths over and over put it in the forge, take it out, pound on it. Put it in the forge, take it out, and pound on it over and over. Um, okay, the magnitude of this strain field decreases radially away, right? Obviously, the further you are away from the dislocation, the, the strain drops off. So atoms that are like clear out here, they don't really feel the strain as much as the ones that are right by it, okay? So let's actually look at some videos showing how these things interact with one another. So again, back in the 50s and 60s, scientists loved their bubble wrap videos, and they could actually introduce dislocations and make them interact with each other. Taylor? So instead of putting the fire, could you just look at the uh, electrical current through something and pound it that way? Um, what would that accomplish? <laughs> Like electrical energy, you mean? Yeah. Of it, it would probably achieve the same result because when you heat it up, when you put a current through something, it heats up. Remember, like our, our iron wire demo. So you'd be heating it up just in a different way. So you would get rid of, you'd reduce your dislocation density, but it's still thermal energy that it needs. Because electrons moving is not the same as atoms moving. Atoms have electrons, but they're much harder to move than electrons. Electron mobility can be high, but ionic motion, or at, atomic and ionic motion is generally low. Generally. Okay, so let's look at some bubble rafts. They're gonna introduce dislocations and you can see them interact with one another. All right, so there's a dislocation. There's another one up here. Watch what happens as they come close. He's gonna mess with it, with like a little stick he's got. And they change direction, right? All right, so they can interact with one another. Okay, let's do another one. That was two dislocations creating a third. Here's another one. This is a... Okay, interacting with one another. These are both of the same positive sign. All these are actually all the same sign. They're all pointing that way, right? Watch what happens as he moves them. He tweaks it a little bit with his little stick. Wait for it. And they line up, right? Totally automatically. Why do they line up? What's that all about? You had two that were in the same plane. You messed with it. One came down. It lined up with the ones below it, and this one immediately mind, lined up with it. How come? Um, kind of. Kind of. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, that's it. Right. So if we bring this down so I can reach it. Uh, wherever it is. Oh, it's as far as it'll go. So we've got... Right? This is like an extra half row here, maybe. So this is under compression, but below it is under tension, right? So this was tension, compression. So overall, that's a happy relationship because the tension and the compression overlap here, right? And so all the way around, they want to line up like that. So dislocations in actual materials do the exact same thing. This is just something we can see with the naked eye or with a microscope or something. Um, and so when the guy's poking it with the stick, that's just the same thing, essentially putting the metal back in the fire. When he's poking it with the stick, like what do you think? Oh, no. uh -huh. so, uh, can you put it back? Oh, yeah. Same thing. You're giving it thermal energy for these things to shift around. And this way they're lining up, but they can also annihilate. So let's watch one more. Question, yeah. So along that line, would that be the easiest uh, point of fracture if there were some electronic dust without those being able to move? 
If they were not able to move, yes, because breaking those bonds, they're already costing the system higher energy. So it's going to break those than breaking regular nice bonds. Okay, now let's look at an impurity atom. An impurity atom is something that's either bigger or smaller, right? So let's take a look at it. An impurity atom defines it. Okay, so like right there, this guy's a little bit smaller. That one's a little bit bigger or smaller, right? So watch what happens as these dislocations move around. It stays put, right? For the exact same reason that we've been describing. Um, the other dislocations are moving around happily, but those dislocations want to be right by it because a smaller atom will make the other atoms around it be under tension, right? So the compressive part of the dislocation wants to hang out in that vicinity because overall, if they're separate, it raises the system's energy, but with them together, it reduces it. I, did I confuse Ashley? No, it's just bonkers. It's just bonkers, right? <laughs> atoms are, they're amazing, right? So that's pretty rad stuff, okay? So yeah, these things will go from that to lined up like that, or they can even switch sign and annihilate, right? You can actually heal the system and remove dislocations, okay? And you can see these. So this is something they've, they've etched it, and you can see that these dislocations li have lined up in this material, okay? So dislocations can form uh, at dislocations, meaning they can multiply, and they can also form or end at grain boundaries. So like if, we, if I stuffed an extra half row of seats in here, it's gonna be crowded, but if I just scooch everyone over until that extra half row of seats is stuck out to the edge into the grain boundary, now it's healed itself, right? So grain boundaries can be formed or, or destroyed at grain boundaries, also at internal defects or surface irregularities. Okay, so now let's shift gears and talk about slip systems. Slip systems is just a fancy way of saying the directions along which these dislocations can travel easily. If you noticed in the bubble raft, they kind of picked certain directions. It was kind of a hexagonal lattice and they kind of moved along that hexagonal uh, directions, right? They didn't pick like an arbitrary direction to move along. And the reason why is because there's such thing as what's called a slip system. There's regions where there's directions, there's planes and a direction in that plane where, where dislocation motion is easier. What do we mean when we say easier? What are we actually saying? It costs less energy, right? For that thing to move around, it costs less energy. No. Right? So it costs less energy for that to move around. So we're going to figure out how to do that, right? Um, okay. Uh, something's happening. I think it lost my keyboard. Yeah, it did. Okay. Uh, so dislocation is easier or harder depending on different planes and directions. And a slip system then is a combination of a plane and a set of directions upon which you get easiest motion. And those will be the, 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 the directions upon which your dislocations move, right? So uh, a favorable slip system minimizes distortion and uh, atomic and lattice distortion during the dislocation motion. And they occur on the most densely packed plane in the most densely packed direction, right? So the more crowded a plane and the more crowded a direction, that's the one that where you're going to get dislocation motion. So let's do an example. FCC, right? So FCC. So let's draw our atoms in the FCC lattice. They are at the corners. They're also <coughs> along the faces. So if you were to pick a direction, first let's pick a plane. What plane is the highest density plane here? It's hard, to, it's hard to see, but take a guess. Turn to your neighbor and take a guess which one it might be. Okay, anybody feel confident in their answer? Which one would be the highest density plane? Anybody? The most densely packed plane, any guesses? Let's rule some out. Well, actually, you wanna take a stab at it? The one, one, one direction is exactly right. Someone's reading, All right? One, one, one. That means if this was our origin, how do we label the one, one, one? We go in the X direction. We go in the y direction, we go in the z direction, and we intersect at 111. By the time we flip it, it's still just 111. 
So that's the one, one, one direction. If we draw that standalone, it would look like this, right? Where we had our, our atoms, there's one here that intersects. Here, atom here, atom here, atom here. That's pretty stinking dense, right? That's a very dense plane. Another way that you could have known that is we know that the FCC cubic lattice can be made up of all these hexagonal planes, right? If you remember our tennis ball stacking, we said that we could take rows of hexagonally packed planes, and if we stack them A, B, A, B, A, B, that's hexagonal. But if we go A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, that gives us FCC. So deep somewhere in this you know, cubic looking lattice, there's actually a hexagonal row, and, and we just found it basically, right? So that's the highest density plane. So what is the density of that plane? We've done these before. What would that density of that plane be? Planar density. So you'd figure out the number of atoms on it and divide it by the area, right? So how many atoms do we have? That's the first one. So let's count the halves first. They're easy. That's one, one and a half. What about these three? They're, they're one sixth each, and there's three of them, two atoms. We've got two atoms here, right? Two atoms. Let's do this in terms of the lattice parameter. Remember that the lattice parameter is A. Therefore, this distance is what? What is that distance there? Yeah, square root of 2 times A, right? So you could figure out the area of this triangle, right? You could do 2 divided by that area of that triangle, and it's a number. I don't, I don't know if I have a calculator. Let's skip it. But if you compare that with, say, like one of these faces, let's compare it with, uh, with this face over here, it would be a lower number. The, the 1, 1, 1 plane would be a higher planar density, so it is the highest density plane. Now that said, we're halfway through. That's not the slip system. That's the slip plane. But a slip system is what? A plane and a direction. So what's the highest density direction? Is it, you know, is it this way? Or is it some other way? Like which one is it? What do we think? So turn to your neighbor, take a stab at it. Okay, let me ask Antonio, what do you think? What's our highest packing direction? Any guesses? It's gotta be along like any one of the sides. Bingo, that's right. Moving right along like uh, this direction or that direction, that's our highest density, right? So this slip system is composed of the 111 family of planes, right? Because I drew this pink one, but I could have just as easily drawn, I'm running out of colors here. Will we see yellow, maybe? Well, you can kind of see that, right? So that's another one in the same family, right? So the, the, uh, the 111 family of planes, and then these, what direction is this along? What's that family of directions called? Remember directions we do in square brackets and families of directions we do in pointed brackets. Yeah, the 110 family, right? The actual direction, if it's this direction right there, you can figure out the actual one. It would be, it, it's going back in the x direction by one, it's going nowhere in y, and it's going up in z. So it would be the negative 101. But it's the family of 110 directions, right? So the family of uh, let's be consistent on the colors. The family of, we use curly brackets for families of planes. Curly brackets, right? So the family is 111 planes, and the directions is the family is the 110 directions. So now, putting this all together, how many slip systems would we have? So. So turn to a neighbor and start counting these up. They have to be unique. So for example, along this right here, the yellow and pink, there's one there and there. That's the same one, right? Well, I'm forward and backwards, right? So count those up. But all the way through, how would you count this? So turn to a neighbor and give a shot. Thank you. 
Okay, you know what I think we'll do? We're gonna save that for next time. That'll be our clicker question next time. We still have 10 more minutes, so we'll keep going. So you can work on that, or even better, it's right in the book. So read the book, and that will start on clicker question next time with that, and then we'll actually work it out, okay? So FCC and BCC have relatively large numbers of slip systems, but other, other metals like uh, magnesium, and some of these other ones that are hexagonal, close packed, they have very few, only three or six, right? So you know, that the answer is going to be greater than three or six, right? In fact, it's going to be much greater, right? So if you have fewer slip systems, then you don't have very many ways for dislocations to move. What will that do? It's going to make it more brittle. It's going to make it more likely to break, right? If you can't move the dislocation to accomplish deformation, then you can't deform. And if you don't deform, you're a ceramic, basically. You're a brittle material, right? So if you have a system that has more, more slip systems, then it is more ductile. This is a common test question, a common final <coughs> question that I'm testing for whether you understood this concept. Increase the number of slip systems, how will it respond to an applied load? It's going to be more likely to plastically deform and fracture. Yeah, Eric? So if you're hardening steel to tempering, are you actually reducing the number of slip systems? Um, we'll talk about heat treatment with metals and why that changes the hardness later in chapter 11, kinetics. It's a different mechanism than, I mean, it has to do with dislocation motion, but before we can really adequately describe it, let's wait till we get to the kinetics chapter. Matt? Okay, so a key thing, number of slip systems. Think of it like if you're trying to get out of this room, if there's like a fire, if you want to avoid smashing through the wall Kool-Aid man style <laughs> fracture, right? Then we want as many exits as possible. We want as many avenues to move as possible. Same with atoms. Dislocations for them to move, the more ways that they can move, the less likely it is to just break, right? So if you have more slip systems, more ductile. If it is fewer systems, it's more likely to cool admin and just break. Yeah, Antonio? So those slip lines are thermodynamically favorable like, methods for the dislocations to move? Yeah, and the reason why, we mentioned it earlier, is because moving along those requires less m messing with atoms. So imagine, atoms are people, we talk about all the time in class. So if Matt is our atom and he wants to move out of this row, he would go along this mass direction right here. He would not like go like some random diagonal direction like climbing over teeth and company because they wouldn't like that and that costs energy and it's more likely to just fracture than do that, right? So that's what happens. Atoms are just like people. Okay? Ashley? So if you have a dislocation, would I get a point dislocation and the other can be switching places with other atoms so uh -huh. instead of like having as much? They can, but they can. So if you have a dislocation that's like the screw dislocation, where it's an entire edge that's kind of offset. Yep. Does that move as one? Yeah, like this off? whole dislocation line, imagine like the core of like your parking structure, right? The helix goes around that, that whole car would like, that whole core would move, right? So all those atoms are moving together. And the reason why do they move together? Well, because if one of them moves apart, it creates more strain than if they were to move together. The overall energy is reduced to have it in a nice line. Basically, if it splits and it created a new, new dislocation. That can happen, but it's lower energy for it to all move together, right? So cooperative motion of atoms is, a, is an important area of material science. There's, there's transformations from one phase to another called uh, Martin-Siddick transformations. Those are accomplished by all the atoms, just like a football line, when the quarterback says go, they all shift, right? All at the same time. Same thing, that, there's a certain type of reaction, we'll learn about it later in chapter 11, that is cooperative motion. And this is an example of cooperative motion, is dislocation motion meaning that they all do it in, in sync a little bit, okay? That's not super common though. Okay, number of slip systems, we'll pick up there next time. We got five more minutes, let's keep going. Let's talk about slip and single crystals. So single crystals are just like regular ones, but now instead of having grain boundaries, all the way through the material, it's got one orientation, right? So what if, imagine that this whole row is perfect, right? This whole middle section is one grain, so it's a single crystal, right? And let's say I'm, I'm applying a force that would really like to make Ryan's row of atoms here like shift that way. But that's not, a, on a, that's not an acceptable slip position, right? If I took the single crystal and I shoved this way on these atoms, then they could all slide past one another, no problem. Great, right? But if you pick some off angle, what, what options does it have? It can either fracture, or what could it do? 
if you make this location, they still like they still gotta move along a certain direction. If that's not available, what can I do? There's something called the resolve shear stress, right? Which says if I'm applying a force this way, I can break that force up into a component this way and a force and a component that way. So some fraction of my force, it won't be the whole thing, it will depend on the angle, right? But some fraction of my force, even though I'm pushing this way, is actually pushing that way. So these things can start sliding past one another because a component, a resolved shear stress is present based off the force I give. So we're gonna see that here, right? You get shear stress along the plane, the, the slip planes, right? And it doesn't have to necessarily be in the same direction as the applied force. So here's our applied force, right? This way and that way, we're pulling it apart. But for whatever reason, this crystal was grown such that here's its slip plane, right, at some angle. And in that plane, you've got this direction, right? So that's where it wants to slide. It wants to slide like breaking a chunk and slide like that, right? So can it do it, right? We can test this, right? It can, right? So to figure it out, first we have to figure out if you have an applied load sigma up here. Sorry, the load is F, the stress is sigma, right? If you have that stress, what is our resolved shear stress along some arbitrary direction? And that direction is both as a function of this angle right here between the loading direction and the slip direction, as well as the loading direction and the normal to the plane. Okay, those are the two directions we need to know. If you have those two angles, we can actually calculate what is the resolved shear stress literally along this direction that that thing experiences. And if that resolved shear stress is greater than whatever the critical resolved shear stress is, in order to have Adam start sliding, then it'll slide. And if not, then it won't, right? Any questions on this right now? Got four minutes, let's do an example, right? So let's say this is our resolved shear stress, right? So sigma is our applied load. This is the angle between the direction that we load it and the normal to the slip plane. Gamma, again, reminding you, is just the angle between the load and the slip direction. And then this is the critical stress that we have to hit to have it actually start sliding. So we could actually, I could give you a stress, I could give you a, a, a direction, a plane and a direction, and I could say, is it enough to deform? And all you have to do, plug it into these simple formulas and calculate whether or not the, the stress that you get is larger than uh, the, the critical resolve your shear stress, right? So I don't think we have quite enough time to finish that today. So we'll pick up here and we'll start that next class. So tickets there if you want that. And then one more reminder, if you came in late, I've partnered with a local ski company and they have a new product that they're trying to develop and we need somebody to help do the actual research on some composite skis. So send me an email if you're interested. Let me close this real quick, sorry. I actually think you were before.